thank you so much, uh, Chris and Jeff and everyone backstage, and thank you all so much for being here this morning. So I wanted to start uh, with a question. I wanted to know how many of you have been tweeting while somebody on stage was speaking, if you could raise your hand. Or how many of you will be tweeting maybe throughout the day? So that's probably over 50% of you. And I want you to think about why you've been doing this and to whom. To whom have you been tweeting? Who is on the other side of those tweets? And we'll go back to this um, at the end of the presentation. So my talk is about slowness. And by slowness, I mean that I've been trying to engage with moments around being able to pause, being able to be still, being able to engage in activities that are not necessarily on my to-do list, being able to do things that are outside of what is expected of us. Um, and why I'm interested in slowness is because I think that we're able to slow down. We used to have a luxury of time that has become less and less so because of technology. And I think that we can return to that. We could return to this idea of uh, slowing down. So this all started uh, for me in 2007 when I began traveling to Guatemala with students from Parsons and the New School uh, here in New York. And we've been working there with artists and women, supporting them in developing businesses. And so we prepare students on campus and we travel there and our students teach workshops. And that year that we were there, we were there for a month and we were hoping that by the end of the month we would have products that we could bring back and showcase on, in Fashion Week or maybe sell. So we hit the ground running and we just had a slew of workshops to offer the artisans in business design and marketing. And we quickly realized that our pace, our reference of time and space was ex from New York was very different than the way that they lived in this lakeside uh, village in Guatemala. And we really had to take a step back and since then have learned that it's okay if they show up an hour and a half late to a workshop that maybe only lasts for an hour because we're much more sensitive to introduce our work uh, in the, the schedule and the timing of these women. To give you an example of this, this is Romelia, one of our artisan collaborators. She's standing in her dining room, which is also her classroom, where she teaches adults in her community to read and write. She's there with her two daughters. And one of the workshops that our students taught was in time valuation. And the activity was to take a poster, a sheet of paper, and write down your, uh, a, t a typical day in, in your life, so starting from the morning. So I'm just gonna go through this uh, translate quickly. So Romelia wakes up at 5 a.m., she thanks God, she gathers the fire, grinds the corn, makes tortillas, prepares breakfast, cleans the kitchen, dresses her baby, feeds her, bathes her two daughters. All of this happens by 8 a.m. The daughters go to school, and then uh, she cleans her bedroom, gets ready, makes lunch, gets ready for work, weaves a bit, teaches adults for three hours, makes dinner, feeds her family, puts her baby to sleep, and then goes to rest and sleep with the angels. And these are her words. One of the things that our students were most struck by was the lack of leisure activities. And in our day-to-day uh, -day calendars, we had a lot of choices that we were making. I'm going to catch up with a friend, I'm going to go to a movie, I'm going to um, answer an email, write a blog post, send out a tweet. And in conversation with uh, the women there, with the artisans, they really express to us that they don't have those choices, that they really feel that their schedules are filled with activities that they feel they have to do. So she has to gather the ingredients to make food for her kids. She has to spend as much time as she can trying to generate income to make a living. This was extremely humbling. Uh, we've learned a lot from this. Our students have learned a lot. I've learned a lot about myself about human beings, uh, um, about uh, learning, about education. So what does this um, have to do with choice? I just wanna encourage you to consider that our lives are full of choices. We have chosen to be here today. We have chosen the computers that you're holding, the devices that you're using. We have chosen to be here instead of being somewhere else, or perhaps if you're leaving in two minutes, you're choosing to go somewhere else. We're also choosing what to buy, what to eat, um, and some of us obviously have constraints around work, but we have this uh, luxury of time that is becoming more and more interrupted by technology. 
What does this have to do with technology? When I come back to New York, I definitely feel a different internal pace. I feel that I am much more slower than the city around me, which moves at a very high speed. And that is because during that month that I'm in Guatemala, I'm living in a place where the internet goes down if it rains too much, or if the, they can't afford to buy cell phone minutes, suddenly there's no way to contact them other to, than to walk to their homes. I come back to New York and there are at least a half dozen ways that people can reach me. We're all extremely interconnected. I'm sure that you could add to this list with URLs and all sorts of different things. And all I want is to disconnect. So these experiences in Guatemala have really been a wonderful opportunity for me to find the time and the space to slow down. And what I've been trying to do since then is to try to, to think about how can we, through technology, create moments for slowing down. And this is something that um, I want to challenge you with. Now, what is the education with the EDU part of the conference, with the education part? I believe that to be able to learn, we need to have undivided attention and specific amounts of time to dedicate to activities. Uh, the, the previous speaker was talking about reading. Reading is probably, for me, the beginning of learning. And reading, it could be reading a book, watching a video, listening to a lecture. There are various ways that we can read. There's also the activity of writing, critical reflection, synthesis analysis, all of these things that we do as educators. But what happens when those activities are interrupted? Can our students learn as much? Do they really have quality learning if they are being uh, interrupted in those activities? Our students are being born and have been born into a culture of interruption. Um, what can we do about this? Should we be designing spaces that allow for uninterrupted learning? And it doesn't necessarily mean disconnecting, but this is just uh, a question I have. I know that Google hasn't made me stupid, but I certainly have noticed a decline in the quantity of time I can spend reading a book before I'm distracted with something else. There are uh, some people trying to solve this issue. This is uh, Steve Lambert. He's a, an artist based out of Boston. He developed this free downloadable application called Self Control, which allows you to uh, you install it on your computer, and then you tell it, the application, when you start it, to block you from either your internet access or perhaps your email application, or maybe even you can put in the URLs of Facebook and Google+. Plus. For that, once you press start, it will not let you access those things that you've blocked for yourself. You cannot quit out of it. You cannot close it. This is, we're ceding our control to this application. I share this with my graduate thesis students who are always very appreciative because they, they are able to now create time to write by using this application. This, um, this quote is from a review I found online. There are now myriad uh, full screen word processors out there. This one in particular is called Q10. And I was really, I guess, struck by the, the last sentence. It even comes with sound effects that try to imitate a typewriter, as if that made us better writers or whatever it may be. But the core of this review was that the fact that the word processor was full screen meant that uh, we were now isolated from the interruptions of the instant message coming in or the email coming in, the tweet, whatever it may be. When I look over the shoulder of one of my students when we're in a critique or whatever it may be to look at their work on their screen, it's amazing how many things they have popping up. And maybe some of you work that way. I certainly turn it all off to, to really try to eliminate uh, the distractions. And lastly, technology is moving in this way of the quantified self. We are able to quantify our lives. Many times it's for really positive things, so I think there are great uh, health benefits of being able to track our data, our statistics, where we go, what we do. Um, but I was really disappointed that this article in this MIT journal was focusing on, and we can also be more productive. And I wonder, and my question to you is, is that really the problem that we're trying to address? Is it that we're not productive enough? Or is it that there's always the next thing to do and therefore we are scrambling to try to make more time for ourselves? So I wanna go back to the question I asked you about the tweeting and just have you think about, and you can share it with me later, or maybe you could even tweet it out, why are you tweeting? Is it 
about, is it an ego thing? So I tweet to create a following. Is it about uh, creating a, a network of colleagues, peers? Is it related to our jobs? What, what, what is really the reason behind that? And next time you're tweeting and tweeting at these events, is it not sufficient that you're listening and taking in this information from people speaking? What is it about the tweet that then continues that conversation and really expands it? Furthermore, I want to invite you to think about the generation gap that exists between us and our students who don't know the world before and after this connectivity. Because we've been exposed to the before and after, we can see the great value of creating these networks, but when you're born into that, the value is not necessarily there and their use of technology is very different. If a student was tweeting while you were lecturing in class, would you be okay with that? And that's a, an interesting question that I'm um, always trying to tackle. So finally, uh, next time something or someone is trying to accelerate you, such as this ad I saw in a New York City subway, uh, life moves fast, shouldn't your news? Just say no, thank you. Let's please <laughs> slow down. So thank you very much. And we have uh, two and a half minutes, so I would love to take a question or two or a comment. Any hands? Yes. Right. Is this idea of crowdsourcing their notes. And I think that's one of the powers of something like Twitter is it, it becomes a broader voice and it's not just your own thoughts. You can bounce that off of other people and you have students in this in real discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great comment. I think crowdsourcing is one of the most valuable things that I, I see and experience with social media. Any other? Yeah. So the question is, has anybody been able to hack self-control? Well, the idea with self-control is if you want to hack it, just don't use it. So <laughs> the only way to hack it is to force your computer to shut down, and then once you reboot, you're out of it. Did you have a question? That's right. Uh, and uh, so I actually like uh, being able to control the speed. Like, let's go, let's go, let's go. Yeah, I know that, I know that. Let's go to something I don't know. And this is the premise of some new educational initiative, such as the Khan Academy, which is to let students decide how much time they want to spend on a specific topic or subject matter. So it's really interesting. Well, I'm going to not wait till the music starts. Thank you very much. Thank you.